Battle to the American Revolution is a system for wargaming published by GMT and it depicts battles of, well, the American Revolution, the American War of Independence. It is a system that has been around for many years now. I started playing it fairly recently, a couple of years ago, with Germantown, that's the oldest game that I had tried. And since I like the game, uh, the, I like Germantown and several of the games that came after that one, I from time to time thought, oh, I should definitely get some of the older ones. But then I could never find them from the same seller, and the idea of thinking, oh, well, getting one game from a seller and paying shipping, then another game, another seller, independent shipping, somehow I never, never got to actually pull the trigger and buy the older games, because I also thought, the system is successful enough, GNT from time to time republishes some of their older titles, maybe sooner or later they will republish some classics like Guildford, Saratoga or Brandywine. Guess what? My fate and patience have been rewarded because not only has GNT republished those three games, but actually they put them together in a nice mega pack. Guildford, Saratoga and Brandywine. A new and enhanced versions with mounted maps, very high production values, very uh, good looking games and all in a single nice package. So finally I got uh, I got to, to try these three classics of the battles of the American Revolution series and in this video I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about them. I'm gonna show you the maps, I'm gonna show you some of the components and I'll give you a general sense of my experience of playing them. I mean general what is the gameplay what is the flow that you can expect from these from these three uh, three battles no three titles that actually contain uh, four battles Guild Force, Saratoga, Brandy One and also Utah Spring so without further ado let's take a closer look at the contents of this box let's start by taking a look at the boards the set comes with two double-sided boards for a total of four battle maps here we have the map for youth or spring and it's a very simple very clean map as you can see and the art is simple but it's pleasant and nice enough i find it is also very functional very readable the color palette is nice so i like it this is a small scenario it only uses half of a sheet of counters and it has a very strong defender versus attacker dichotomy which is actually a constant in the battles in this set the british are going to defend here they're going to be uh, partially demoralized, or at least they're going to lose some morale when the Americans pass that perimeter there. And so they are going to be the defenders and they're going to try to protect their encampment. Overall, a simple, small battle and definitely a good introduction to the system and to the set even. On the other side, we have the board for the battle of Guildford Courthouse. Guildford Courthouse. You can see the color palette is very different. Here we have different tones, uh, more on the brown, grayish. Also much uh, a much thicker visual texture. As you can see, it's not just that the color is different, it's really that the style, for example, the illustrations, the style of the trees is very different. Much thicker woods here. Which also have to say make set up a little harder when you're trying to retreat the numbers that are printed in here. Here even when we are looking at the wood axis as you can see the numbers are clearly readable because they are in a blank area or in any case in a fairly clean area of the map. Here well, probably because of the background is a little darker I find it much harder to retrieve to retreat the numbers there. Not a particular problem for me, but I know that some uh, were gamers are there. Uh, let's say you're not getting any younger, they have reached the wisest uh, age, and so their eyes may not be as sharp as they used to be. Here we have another another scenario that has a strong uh, defender versus attacker dichotomy. At this time, the Americans are the defenders, and uh, for them, defending Guilford Courthouse and the surrounding area is going to be the main objective. 
Here we have the board for Saratoga, definitely the most stunning of the mall visually, but also probably the one that is a little a little more problematic to read. Again, especially if your eyes are not as young as they used to be in 1974. Very thick visual texture. Again, it's beautiful, but uh, finding the numbers to set up, it's very tough. Here there isn't even in many of these X's they didn't even in some there is a clear area around the X in other cases the number on the X is simply printed on what's not easy not all that easy to read but if not for that if you can be patient where you're setting up the game then the result really is visually appealing this time the Americans are the defenders so they are defending this area here there are some hexes so with that symbol that symbol there they need to be constantly garrisoned so that is a big restriction there there is another important victory area here and there's an interesting situation that emerges from a conscious that there was among American leaders, one of whom preferred a defensive approach, the other one wanted more of, a, of an act an active defense and so because of the compromise between these two visions the American player has some restriction as to which units can be moved some again they are mandated to remain in a defensive position to gaze on those areas they cannot be released early on and some of the units actually can be moved more freely and in particular they can be sent probably to defend this area here which again is important for victory points the uh, the crown player will enter units from this area here. Later on, some will debark from the river, and so the, um, the English player will have to decide how many units to commit to try to take this area here, and how many to try to push against the American defenses. Most likely there in that bottleneck by the river there, which has some earthworks not that great and also has its flanked uh, defended by the river on one side and by woods on the other side so very challenging terrain moving along this path seems to be the natural thing um, also to try to avoid all the penalties and restrictions that come from crossing these streams but very challenging terrain here but challenges also uh, for the other player for the American player because going anywhere again you had to move uh, through a net of fairly predictable paths very interesting very interesting situation Brandywine Brandywine is on the other side of this mounted board here Again, we return to a cleaner, simpler style like the one that we saw on the map for Utah Spring and one that I like very much. Less detail, but far from abstract, you know, evocative enough. When I see this area of the map, I do think, oh, woods, uh, stream, uh, hills, I don't have any problem. And it still feels very thematic, it still feels like this, this art here, well, a little more abstract, a little more economic, it's still... Uh, pretty good at delivering delivering the setting creating a sense of setting this time the Americans are defending here in the central in the central here on the side of the of the Brandywine River they are restricted in the early phases of the game to this pretty much to this section of the map here the British player will be entering from here, from here mainly, and or some units can be delayed and entered from here, which is all fine, okay, there's some mass everybody here, problem is later on in the game there will be a group of units entering from there, marching straight towards that area, which is a very important victory, victory area, so the American player cannot neglect that, so there's an interesting and very fluid situation here, because the American player has to work on these two fronts, and manage not to deplete this front entirely to protect this one, and of course vice versa, probably it'll be about holding this flank of the of the area for a while then weakening it to protect that one and maybe even give up some give up some uh, some areas here kind of like trade up time for for space and still just holding until the end and protecting important victory areas very interesting situation definitely my favorite battle in this system 
Now, to talk a little bit about the game system. The game keeps track of the morale of the two armies. There are army markers that will go up and down on this track. Several events will increase or decrease the morale of the two armies. And also the band in which the morale, mm, the morale marker is will give different modifiers to the players. And one of the ways of winning the game is to demoralize the opponent, that is to bring their army morale marker down to zero and that indicates the success of a certain army to to weaken the willingness of the opponent to fight as for the units the units that we have in the conflict uh, we have artillery we have infantry we have cavalry and we have leaders Leaders have ranks printed on them and then we have a combat modifier, a leadership modifier and then a movement value. The uh, other combat units have a strength value here, movement value here and a morale modifier. Again, morale is very, very important. The the turn sequence is very simple, it's very linear, it almost just amounts to a player moves and then you result combat, the other player moves and then you result combat, turn is over. There are a couple of extra phases there but the general architecture is very basic. At the beginning of a turn you roll dice and apply modifiers to determine who has initiative, who goes first, which can be incredibly important. Then the first player in the turn will, uh, will go to their movement phase where they place reinforcements on the map and then they move all of their units that are able to move. Some units may have been pinned in a previous combat, they have this marker on them. The Active player can still move them, but there will be a penalty in terms of morale for doing so. Again, the general idea is just move around, set up an attack, try to reach your objectives, retreat, and so on and so forth. After moving, after moving, the active player can try to rally their units uh, that are disrupted or shattered, and they will have this marker on them. You take a morale test and hope that your units will recover one step of of organization that is going from shatter to at least just disrupted or to disrupted from from fully organized parade order as it is described in the game so we have movement then we have rally and then we start fighting However, the first shots are fired by the non-active player. After the rally phase in a turn, we have the defensive, defensive artillery phase, in which the artillery pieces of the non-active player get to fire on the active player. This is fun and very interesting because it keeps both, both players involved. By the way, this is not one of those huge games that uh, one side is moving 200 pieces and so the opponent is taking a nap as that is happening. The movement phase of the active player is not too long, and on top of that, right after that, the non-active player is involved. So, the uh, non-active player can fire their artillery pieces that have line of sight and are within range of possible targets, and you try to inflict damage to disrupt the opponent, so on and so forth, which can be very powerful because the opponent may have set up a mighty attack against you. Now, the, um, the defensive artillery will disrupt some of those units, force them, to retreat and now the attack that was set up and needs to be resolved later in the turn is not nearly as strong as the active player hoped. After the um, defensive artillery phase we had the rifle phase, some units are marked as having rifles and all rifled units both belonging to the active and non-active players will get to fire on possible targets at that point. So this time again, both players are actively involved, potentially at least, in attacking the opponent. After you resolve the, the rifle fire phase, you have the close combat in which the active player again takes the initiative, so to speak. The active player will assign different combat units to attack to attack enemy units that are adjacent to them uh, with some restrictions, with some obligations such as the idea that everybody that can be attacked must be attacked and so on and so forth. How you resolve combat in general? Well, as for as for range combat, so we both artillery and rifle fire, you will first roll you will first cross reference the number of strand points that are firing. 
uh, with the range that can be adjacent or two to three axis that gives you a number to hit you roll apply modifiers and if you're able to meet or exceed the number to hit then the firing unit scores a hit if a hit was scored then you roll on this at the table to determine the type of damage and there are four sub tables one is rifles firing versus non-artillery rifle firing versus artillery artillery versus non-artillery and artillery versus artillery roll a die and see the result uh, those letters the the meaning is explained here retreat uh, disruption step loss and so on and so forth so there is pretty much a single system to resolve rifle and artillery and that is and that is neat is very very economic very simple and yet this still has enough detail that you know you get the sense that rifles are not firing exactly in the same way as artillery now as for close combat for close combat it's based on odds ratio so the strength total strength of the of the uh, attacker divided by the strength of the opponent so you will have ratio of you know one to one two to one the somehow dreaded three to two columns. I've seen various penis war gamers suffering a lot trying to figure out a three to two. It seems very easy to me. I don't even have a PhD in math, but I don't know. Not everybody seems to find the three to two column easy to read. And then we have the traditional three to one, four to one, and so on and so forth. So by calculating the odds ratio you find the column that will be used and then you will determine lead units that will be the ones that will give modifiers but also will take uh, to take the, the brunt of the attack you determine all modifiers by consulting this section of the of the player aid here which is a little daunting at the beginning it's a lot of them but trust me after a little bit that you're familiar with the system it will be second nature you have say the net morale of the attackers lead unit uh, modifiers for the commanding leader defending units that are disrupted of course that should give uh, benefits to the attacker so they're really, uh, defending you as a militia, well of course it's a little easier to attack them. So it really makes sense, they are thematically and contextually appropriate modifiers, so it's not that hard to become familiar with them. Modifiers applied! Um, next, uh, the players will define, will decide the tactics that they're going to use. There is a set of cards uh, in a set of cheats you can use either one each player will select a cheat or a card indicated one of the two tact of the possible tactics they will reveal them simultaneously and then they will cross-reference the tactic chosen by the attacker with the tactic chosen by the defender and that will give you a another modifier to the die roll yes a little bit of complexity here it may slow down resolution a bit but it's kind of fun to see what happens if the attacker attacks on echelon while the opponent is withdrawing or the attacker commits the reserve as the defender is standing fast really interesting situations so once you have totaled the modifiers from here add that modifier go to the column that you had determined before roll a die apply the modifier and then by cross reference the modified result with the column you will find the result of that of that close combat of that close combat action and the results to the left of the slash apply to the attacker and the ones on the right apply to the defender and again it can be army morale loss retreat disruption step losses and so on and so forth also some situations will allow a player to gain a momentum chip which is a chip that can be used for various functions it gives an advantage later for example it can be used to reroll a die in general this is how combat works once you resolve that then you pretty much repeat the sequence repeat the sequence now it is the player that used to be the non active player that executes movement to rally then you have defensive artillery and again simultaneous rifle phase the active player uh, announces and resolves combat but again even in that phase remember the non active player is still involved by choosing the tactics that is how the turn works, so with two players taking these two turns, or two players turn that have the same structure, and then you move to the next turn, and you continue like this, turn after turn, until either the end of the scenario, or a player meets the victory conditions for the scenario, and each scenario has different ones, so, well, it all depends on the type of battle that you're playing.
So I'm very, very pleased with this nice package here. There's a lot of gaming in here. There is really good, good value for your money. Um, of course, it's not the most inexpensive war game set out there, but what you get in here with those mounted boards and just those very nice looking counters, I think, I think it's totally worth it. Also, you have player aids. Uh, everything is of very good quality. And production value is important, but then of course what is important is the gameplay is also very, very good. And, and of course the battles are not uh, the, not all the same, luckily enough, and that is part of the beauty of it. And they're not at least to me equally compelling, in particular the battles of Utah Spring and Guildford. I find them, they're a good introduction, they're a good introduction to the system if, for example, you never played it before. I, 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 uh, this package here, it could be a great introduction to the system and actually it could just be a great introduction to Wargaming. If you're just getting started with Wargaming, this is a great system in general uh, for beginning Wargamers and in particular uh, the first two battles are are absolutely great for new Wargamers because they are they are simple, they have a very intuitive flow, um, there is a very strong dichotomy, defender, defender versus defender versus attacker, uh, very intuitive, very simple. You have very simple rules and at the same time a gameplay that doesn't have too many extra rules, too many individual cases. Those two battles are absolutely great uh, for if you're just starting with war gaming or in any case introduce a new friend to war game. Also because they're smaller, because they don't take too long to play. So talking brandy wine, I, I would say for advanced beginners, um, meaning they could be perfect after you're starting and you want to get to something a little more complex. Not so much more complex in terms of rules, so because the rule system is the same and they have a couple of extra rules, so, but not too many. More complex in terms of a gameplay that has more strategic options, that has more things to consider, has a different and more organic use of the maps with different types of movements. You have to split forces, you have to take more things into account. It would be, again, the perfect transition for somebody that after just starting, they want a little more complexity, but not not like a quantum leap into uh, something that would take 10 days to play, that has very long manuals, etc, etc. You have simply pretty much the same system with a more engaging, with a more engrossing situation with more meat to chew, with more things to consider and dilemmas to solve. And of course that is great. So when I said that that's however the Saratoga and Brandywine are perfect for advanced beginners doesn't mean that that is the cap, that the, that there isn't anything in there for advanced war gamers. And to me this is the beauty of the system because it is open to true beginners or somewhat advanced beginners but also it is just a blast to play for anybody who enjoys war, gamer, war gaming. Even if you have started a long time ago, even if you're a seasoned veteran, these are just fun battles. This is a system that is so intuitive, that moves so well, that moves so fast, that is so organic, where things just make sense in such a way that I can't imagine people that like war gaming in general, even if they've been playing it for, for decades, they would be turned off by anything that they see here in, in gameplay. Now, uh, speaking of Saratoga and Brandywine, again, those are definitely the battles that I like uh, that I like the most. Um, Saratoga I like, and again, because of, of, the, of the more fluid organization um, and action that you have on the map with two or three mains foci of, of action. Of course, you have the American field uh, where they're defending, but then you are also, as American player, detaching forces from there. And then you have the farm in the middle that attracts a lot of attention. And the other focus of attention, of course, is the is the uh, is the army of the crown is the British army that will have to decide also how to split forces ignore the farm maybe not a great idea but then you invest too much there rather than pushing against the American defenses on the north so very interesting situations for both players it's about figuring out how to split their forces and of course the beauty is that most likely you will regret whatever you do whatever you do like oh, I should have done more on the other side the other horn of the dilemma, the other horn of the action. 
Also, uh, the map is pretty interesting uh, because of all of the vegetation, because of how the the paths uh, in um, the paths in the woods, so in a sense, restrict the action. And, but that somehow doesn't feel limited. It just feels that there are important decisions that you had to make as you commit to a certain path, and it would be possible to try to move around those 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 paths or to just go completely into the wilderness but of course it takes a while it's very expensive so I find that the nether roads on that map um, does direct does give direction to the action and that's kind of like channel it along certain channels but I didn't find it was limited I didn't find that the map was you know, spoon feeding me or railroading me towards one action or the other again if nothing else because it is about committing different groups and different amount of force to different different paths and seeing what happens there and for the defenders of course that is also pretty important because then you can count most likely on the opponents going towards certain bottlenecks rather than rather than others um, Brandywine however is definitely my favorite battle because it is the one that has more uh, movement, more options, more possibilities on the map and it also has an interesting play drama that tragedy even that is in several acts especially if you're playing uh, the full campaign, the full scenario, which I did in, in all of the games that I played here. Uh, then, of course, you have the first attack from the south against the Brandywine, um, against the Brandywine River, and then you have the defenders on the other side that are moving around and try to react to different directions that the attack may come from. The attacker may choose to just ram against the defenses in one direction, can choose again to split in different paths and try to outflank the defenses and then, of, uh, then at that point the defenders have to choose if they want to concentrate certain areas and to stretch a little bit and then act uh, act two after the defenders probably will feel pretty good like whoa we were able to stop them. It's kind of hard at that point for the for the attackers to make really a strong impact, to have a strong impact there. You can gain position, you can weaken the opponents, and that is the, the important thing. Because then, of course, you have the second group of attackers that will come from the side and will easily, and will easily march towards those very precious objective areas on the on the top side of the map and then the defender is there pretty much stuck between a group that comes from here and the other group that comes from here and if and yes there is the foreknowledge as the defender you know that the group is coming and getting there um, and therefore most likely you will try in the earlier phases not to concentrate all of your forces here not to make an impenetrable wall here because then otherwise at that point you're too far from the objective areas that you're trying to defend so for the defender it's a very interesting situation here because the defender has to balance uh, uh, pretty much again the two, the, two, the, the two different prongs of the enemy attack and it's very easy if you concentrate all of your defenses against only one but if you do so then that's probably gonna be disastrous in the long run because then the opponent can reach victory uh, victory objectives very easily so i really like the challenges that come that come from the fact that there are two attacks that come from completely different directions they have different objectives they need to be handled differently and therefore the strategy of the defender has to sort of like balance uh, the initial attack with the one that you know will come next it just uh, makes the action um, happen more organically in different areas of the map and it makes it overall very interesting and fun to play so definitely we have these two major battles then we have two introductory battles they the, put together these four battles make for a very very rich very entertaining very entertaining very compelling wargaming experience uh, I again I did enjoy them all at this in the same way I enjoyed Brandywine and Saratoga much more I was still happy to play Guildford and Utah Spring if nothing else because I hadn't played games in this system for a while and so those small quick battles were a great way for me to 
warm up again to the system to kind of like you know get my the little cogs and parts of my of my war gaming um, war gaming brain um, uh, to kind of warm them up and get them going again and get them again into the spirit and the mood of the system and then the, I was ready it was a good warm up activity before I played Saratoga and Brandy one which really are to me the, the crowning jewels of the of the set. Um, I played all battles solitaire, uh, and I find this game to be absolutely, uh, absolutely fine when you're playing in solitaire, but playing both sides of the contest at the best of your possibilities. Yes, there is some hidden information when it comes to the combat system, as both sides have to choose their tactics separately. And yet, frankly, um, I didn't have any problem there. I simply look at the situation and objectively, you know, with a, with a clear and balanced mind, I tried to figure out what each side would reasonably, would reasonably do when not knowing what the other side has chosen. And I was still able to to enjoy uh, combat and pretty much to do that uh, secret selection uh, in a way that I felt, I felt was fair. Because that is the point. I'm playing to see the action. I'm playing to see the dilemmas that the commanders are confronting. I'm playing to see the struggles of the troops and the commanders against the terrain, against the decisions of the opponent. Uh, I have no interest in cheating because I'm the only one playing. I'd be the only one that is cheated here. I would only be cheating myself out of the fun and entertainment that I have having seen the action develop and so I, I didn't find that to be a problem at all. If you have a problem when you're playing the game solitaire, maybe you still want to play this game solitaire and you find that to be a challenge, then use the old rule of the solitaire gamer, which is roll a die. When in doubt, then, you know, this time I select the tactics for the Americans and then roll a die to determine the tactics for the British. Next battle, I select the tactics for the British, it's the best one, and I roll a die for the Americans. And that should, that should help you. But in general, I think these are very solitaire friendly games and then there's enough other variable elements that that even if that one element you struggle a little bit with the game will still be the games will still be able to surprise you all the time to present you with interesting challenges and decisions Guildford, Saratoga, Brandywine, three great titles uh, and in one uh, single package. Great production, absolutely great designs. I'm very glad that I finally have these games in my collection. I had a really good time playing them and I definitely recommend it to anybody who is, in work, who is into Wargaming and anybody who has been playing Wargaming since forever, but especially for those that are just starting because these are a great starting point. Not just because they're easy to get into, not just because they're easy to learn and to play, but because they show you they show you what war gaming is all about. It is about a series of interesting choices and dilemmas within an historical context, within an historically tense and relevant and momentous situation. And, and these battles definitely definitely give you that, definitely help you see what is fun and what is great in Wargaming. Again, Guild Force, Saratoga, Brandywine by GMT. A great pack and one that I, and one that I highly recommend.